Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming to this webinar. I really hope that you're able to take away good information from this. And we really intend to prepare you and inform you for the next time you guys have a machine that you guys need to see test. Now, to begin, I'd like to go over a few notes on this presentation. We won't be able to answer any questions live right now. We're going to have to have you guys comment inside the comment or the question section of the webinar. And we have Alex Shaka, a technical sales engineer for Enero, who will be on there moderating. Now, if there's any questions that you guys have that are pertinent to what I'm going over and I didn't cover and there's multiple questions because I, I just missed the point, we can have Alex interject and he'll make sure that I cover that in better detail. Otherwise, we're gonna cover as many questions as we can at the very end of the presentation. And if there's any questions left over, the engineers will reach out personally to make sure that all questions are answered. And then, of course, we urge you guys to reach out to us if you ever have any questions related to this. So for introductions, my name is Dominic Worthing. I'm a senior technical sales engineer for Enerdor. Enerdor, of course, is a manufacturer of EMI and RFI filters, as well as a CE compliance testing. Now, we also have motor protection, active and passive harmonic filters, as well as voltage stabilizers. So we have a whole host of equipment that can help with power quality and noise issues. Now, I'll be going over the EMC compliance portion of this presentation. I'll be followed by Chuck Siebold, who is our safety engineer, and he will be covering the safety directives and various other CE-related directives. So to start things off, I wanted to give you guys a, a worldview with all the various compliance systems that are used. Now, there's, there's many different systems, and we specialize on CE testing. The reason for that is twofold, the first of which being that we are an Italian company. So back in the 1990s when we started out, it made sense to get into European compliance. Fortunately for us, as worldwide compliance systems developed, the CE marking method kind of stood out as, as a good benchmark, and now it's been harmonized or, or adapted and, and, and works well with many other international compliance schemes. So what we find is by, by working with CE, we get a, a great foothold into worldwide compliance methodologies, and we're able to help out in, in many more than CE, but we do specialize in CE testing. Now, CE testing, it really is a, a conformity system that's based off directives, and there's various directives for different kinds of equipment and that, that come into play for different kinds of equipment. Primarily, there's going to be two categories that we're going to cover, and that's going to be the EMC directive as well as the low voltage or machinery directive. I'll let Chuck get into the other directives. I'm going to specialize in the EMC directive, so we'll start digging into that. EMC directive, it's, it's a, a large directive with, with lots of verbiage to it, but ultimately it all boils down to two key points. And those are gonna be that a, a machine that doesn't interfere with other machines in its environment. And it also, that same machine isn't affected by the other machines within its environment. So what that really, to illustrate that point much better, we have a diagram here of a generic industrial machine um, making noise that may affect a laptop. And the story that I have to go along with this, with this graphic is one of the first tests that I was prefer, performing, we had, large industrial machine. I had all my equipment set up to do a conducted emissions scan. We started the machine so that I could take a measure of the noise it made. And as soon as we started the machine, the, the touchpad on my laptop stopped working. I had to shut the machine down, go find an engineer, get a, a corded mouse that I could plug into my laptop just so that I could hit the, hit the start button on the test. But in the test, we had, we had a solution to that. It was no longer making so much noise. It wasn't an issue. But it's a great example of a machine that's affecting other machines within its environment, which again is a non-compliance to the directive. Now the other part of that is the immunity section where we wanna make sure that a machine isn't damaged or negatively affected by the other machines within its environment. And this is a, a typical situation that we run into where we have a manufacturer reach out to us and they're, they're finding that 8.30 every morning half of their machines just are starting having strange malfunction, things are going funny. Well, we usually will start asking what other, what other uh, industries are being fed the same power as them, what's else on the same utility mains line. And a lot of the time we'll hear something like a, a machine fabric fabrication shop is nearby. 
and they, you know, all their welders come in and come in at 8:30 and start their machines up, and we were able to identify that as a problem. Now, we can find solutions to that, but it's, it's again, it's another great example of a machine that's not immune enough to be with inside of its environment. So the directive is really vague, and it doesn't give us limits on how much noise we have to make. So ultimately, we really don't know if those two examples I gave you, if the machine was making too much noise or the laptop was not immune enough. And on the other side, we don't know. Maybe the maybe the weather was within its own limits, but the machine wasn't immune enough, or the other way around. The only way you can really tell that is by looking into the product standards. Um, so each each product category for the environment it's in is going to have its own standards and its levels of noise that it can make and immunity requirement. Typically, those are going to outline your emissions. So you're going to have radiated conductive emission, which is going to be radiated as the noise that's propagated through the air, and conducted is going to be the noise that's put back onto the main power lines. And then you also have harmonic noise, which is going to be multiples of, of the utility frequency, so 50, 60 hertz, multiples of that frequency, so low frequency noise that's going to distort the power coming in. On the other side, we have various immunity systems or immunity tests that we need to take, and that's going to also be dependent on the environment and the and the specific products that we're testing. So if you have a certain kind of machine, it, it may need to be tested for radio for injected radio noise. You need to make, make sure it's immune to electrostatic discharge. Each product standard is going to be slightly different, and some may or may not require all of these tests or some of these tests. So again. They're all designed to make sure that a specific product works within its own environment. So I've been talking about noise a little bit and I want to get into the, the most important reason is that we need to resolve it. So there's a whole host of reasons here, but they fall into two major categories. The first of which being that a machine is making too much noise to be compliant with a certain compliance system. Now that's, that's obviously we're just going to be able to install filters and we're going to be able to solve those problems. The other issue that we run into though to why we need to solve noise is because the machine just isn't working correctly. So the illustration we have here is of a an ice cream sandwich machine and a, a monitoring system that it has installed to make sure that it's working correctly. It's inserting ice cream between the chocolate wafers when we need it to. Now when the machine starts working maybe they're having trouble and all of a sudden the, the monitoring doesn't doesn't work anymore. You can't tell if the machine's working correctly or not. So by working with them and, and understanding the system, maybe changing wiring practices, maybe changing or installing a filter, typically we're able to, to resolve that noise issue in the machine that just wasn't working right. Now we can we can look at it, we can make sure that it's it's operating correctly and there's no malfunctions. So there's multiple sources of that noise. The the key one that we deal with in industrial environments is gonna hands down be the VFD or the variable frequency drive. We'll be calling it a, a drive throughout most of this most of this presentation. There's there's other noise makers, SCRs, power supplies, CRTs. There, there's anything that's switching DC to AC or AC to DC is gonna cause some sort of noise. But the main culprit that we see and that we're gonna be working with today is gonna be your variable frequency drive. So to go over a little bit of this electrical schematic I have in front of you, we have on the main side, so the main power comes into the VFD and it's gonna hit the bridge rectifiers. Now the, the function of these, I'm, I'm not gonna get into those details, but the, the effect that we have of them is that they're going to cause a lot of harmonic or low frequency issues on the mains power line. And that's gonna be propagated back, only back towards the main power line. Now on the opposite side of the drive on the output going towards the motor, we are gonna run into the IGBTs or insulated, insulated gate bipolar transistors. Now these are devices that switch on and off very quickly. They're, they're simulating a sinusoidal wave at various frequencies to control the speed of a motor. And the side effect of all that switching on and off is gonna create a lot of radio frequency interference. And that noise, and an important thing here is that noise goes on both the input of the filter, so it travels back across the bridge rectifiers and out to the mains, as well as a lot of noise out onto the motor cable. So now that we understand that the VFD makes noise both on the input and the output, 
I'm going to show you a few applications and some simple diagrams to help to help illustrate this and some some things that we do to, to avoid the noise getting from the clean to the dirty side of the power. So here on the left we have a, a good application that we this is what we like to see when our engineers are out in the field where we have the main power coming into a filter. We consider everything before the filter to be clean. In a, in a, in a perfect system, everything before the filter is going to be clean and everything on the output of the filter. So between the filter and the drive, that's going to have noise. And then especially there's going to be a lot of noise on the on the motor cable coming out of the drive on the output of the drive. Now on the left here, we have a, a shielded cable, short cable lengths. They, they come straight into the filter, straight from the filter to the drive, and then back out to the motor on a shielded cable. That's wonderful. What we need to watch out for, though, is applications where the power might come in on the right hand side of an enclosure, go into the filter through the drive. If it's not a shielded motor cable, and then you have an opportunity, if you if you don't go straight out of the cabinet, you go out of the cabinet near where the power comes in, it's very easy to have, have coupling happen that's going to make the dirty side, so the output of the drive, too close to the input, which is clean, and we have coupling that's gonna bypass the benefits of the filter. Now, in order to avoid that, what we like to recommend is to have at least 10 inches between the, the input or the line side of the filter and everything on the load or the output of the filter. And 10 inches is, is a, a, a good rule of thumb. Obviously, you want as much as you can. If you, if you can't get 10 inches or you can't get sufficient space to avoid noise, then we like to see some sort of metal shielding. So a, a conduit or a metal conduit or maybe some shielded cable would be wonderful. What I have seen is some enclosures have actually a metal partition that divides the dirty or the noisy part of the output of the filter from the rest of rest of the cabinet. And having that isolation is really important to make sure that you're not bypassing the filter. The diagram on the rightmost here is going to show us what what we, what we don't like to see. So this is a filter where the input of the filter and the output of the filter are ran right next to each other. And again, you're gonna bypass a lot of the benefits of having the filter there in the first place. And if you're going for a certain certain compliance limit, you don't know if you're gonna get it, where otherwise the filter may have helped you a lot more. So here's another application. Again, we have a, fil a single filter, a single drive going to a motor, but this, this slide is really trying to illustrate the importance of having a shielded cable. So when our engineers are on site, they they often have a, a device called a field strength meter, and that's able to, to, to take measurements on individual lines or individual cables for how much noise is being propagated into the air. Typically, in, a, in an application where there's no shielded cable, we're gonna read between 0 0.5 and two volts per meter on that input of the filter. So this is the clean side. And that's, that's a low number. That's what you might read in just any, open space in an industrial manufacturing environment. But on the dirty side of that same filter, you, you, if there's no shielded cable, if there's, there's nothing to reduce that noise level, you could get between 20 and 100 volts per meter. That, that's a high reading. That's a reading that I'm going to be concerned about. And typically, I'm going to try to solve that before I even continue testing, just to make sure that we're not, we're not working backwards and we can address it as soon as possible. Now the worst, the worst case is when there's no shielded cable or there's shielded cable, but it's not grounded on, on either side. We can take readings that are 200 to 300 volts per meter. That's near the, the max threshold reading of our field strength meters. At that point, I'll, I'll turn the meter off because I don't want to stress its limits. So that's, that's no good. It's not what we like to see. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see we, we added a shielded cable to that and we've grounded it at both ends, which is important. And across, across the whole line, you can see that the noise is reduced. So even on the clean side, which was clean, it's even, there's even less noise present on the clean side of the filter. So I'm going to get minimum values. So 0 0.3 or less is going to read up as, as minimum or low on my field strength meter. And even down where we have the shielded cable, I'm going to take measurements that are 10 to 20 volts per meter. At that level, I'm not worried about it, especially if it's a motor cable reading that low. That's what I like to see. It's I'm not going to be concerned about it, and we're going to be able to find other solutions because there's a shielded cable and it'll be grounded. Now, using shielded cable is very important, but it's also very important that we maximize the benefit of that shielded cable. An issue that we see a lot is 
when people will have a chili cable, they'll pull back the insulation, they see the shielding there, they'll pull the shielding back, twist it into a pigtail, and then ground it either to, to a grounding stud on the VFD or somewhere inside the panel. Now that works, right? We can see that a measurement that we might take on that would be 15 volts per meter. And that's that's in that range where I'm, I'm not too concerned about it. But if you know if there are noise issues that are over and that that's going to be one of the one of the next things I look at if wiring practices are well and everything's well grounded is so that shielded cable really is a weak it could be a weak point if it's not installed correctly. Now conversely you can see we use a shielded cable and if it has either a clamp or a collar or something that makes sure that that shielding isn't pulled back from those conductors until it's within the cabinet you're going to get really low readings even on a shielded cable five volts per meter at that point it's no longer a concern it's no there's no question that that cable shouldn't be making noise and i'm not going to be be exploring that as, as an area to improve so now that we've gone over a few simple applications with single filters and single vfds this is an application of a machine that a multi-axis machine maybe where it has multiple vfds doing various functions and we have to find a way to reduce the noise Typically, what, what we see is they'll use multiple filters, you know, one filter per each VFD, and that's that's not a bad solution. But the issue with that is we need to make sure that we have good wiring practices, and there's more room for error in this in this application. So you can see on the left hand side here, we have a filter and a VFD, and that that dirty line is is run too close to to that clean line, and you're you're bypassing the effects of the filter, and you're you're turning bad a bad power line back into the utility mains the same thing's happening on on the right now in the middle it's it's a good application there's there's no coupling happening but because two out of the three vfds are bypassing their filters through through coupling and through lack of isolation what you get is next to no effect of even the even the correctly installed filter so what we prefer to see or what we what we would like to see rather than the last one is it's a filter where they just clean it all up it's 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 possible it can be a little more difficult because isolating multiple branches from clean and dirty can become difficult very quickly, making sure you have the wire runs isolated and making sure nothing's near each other, but it will work. And it's, it's a good solution where we can get it right. And we can, we have had, had good success with those. It just takes a little more vigilance. An easier solution, and the one that we actually prefer is to have a single filter with multiple VFDs. We let the dirty side stay dirty. All the VFDs can be next to each other. Typically, the, the noise within the cabin isn't going to be an issue if the cabin is well grounded, and then you have almost no chance of coupling dirty lines onto clean lines if you just have the power come into the disconnect, straight into the disconnect, and then go to a filter. From there, everything can be dirty. It's easy to isolate, and the biggest benefit to this is that it's going to cost less. One filter, its size for all the VFDs, typically costs less than, than multiple filters. We also have less space in the cabinet. And then we're going to have a, a shorter installation time. So we've had applications where there was, we used one filter instead of 15, where there were 15 VFDs in the same machine. And that was an extreme example, but if they had to install 15 filters versus one filter, it'd be a significant, a significant use of both space, time, and cost. So now that I've shown those, I'd like to get into some actual real world applications where our engineers were in the field, they saw a, a problem, a common problem, and they were able to take a measurement and they were able to, to show, to bring that back, save that measurement, and we put in the slide to show you guys. So here we have a conducted emission scan. There's two horizontal bars. The red is gonna be your quasi-peak limit line. The blue is gonna be your average limit line. And those correspond to the orange and the purple measurement or detector lines. So the, the orange, the idea here is that that orange measurement can't go above the red line and the purple measurement can't go above its respective blue limit line. And in this case, you can see we've circled it there. There is an issue there. So we have a machine that is making too much noise. Now, our engineer at the time knew that the filter that he was using worked well with the VFD. We had past success with these typically it was able to, to attenuate all the noise that the VFD was making. But when he opened up the cabin, he saw that the power was running across the top of the cabinet to the disconnect. And then when it left the filter, it was using the same, the output of the filter was using the same wire way. So here we have dirty, dirty wires next to clean wires. 
coupling was, was happening and it was, as we can see, making the machine out of compliance. The engineer was able to talk to an electrician that was on site and say, ask if they could just do a simple change where the power came into the left-hand side of the enclosure. The electrician said that wouldn't be a problem. They did it, took a few minutes, they retook the scan. And here you can see that this is a, a, a simple change that was made. It didn't require a change of filter. It didn't require a different BFD. No, no change except for having the power come into the other side of the panel. Simple solution, and it had a, a really significant effect on the scans. And that's that's what Enderwell likes to do is we like to have these simple solutions as opposed to the, the big expensive solutions that really help manufacturers meet compliance with as little pain as possible. Now, another application we ran into, again, we couldn't have the orange line over the red line, can't have the purple line over the blue line, and engineer took a scan and it was over. This is another application where we had an opportunity to recommend a filter that would work well with that VFD make and model. And we expected to have good results. Of course, you still have to test. And this, this justifies that we had to test because there's something wrong. Our engineer opened up the cabinet, was looking at it, and noticed that there wasn't really a good opportunity for noisy power cables and clean power cables to couple with each other. And due to the way everything was lined up inside the panel, you, you couldn't make a whole lot of changes. But when he started following the grounding path is when he, when he saw something. So with high frequency noise, grounding is, is a little different than with, than with a safety ground. For the high frequency noise, the higher the frequency that you're dealing with, the more line impedance you're gonna run into. So having an eight foot, K, eight foot ground line, which is what we had in this case, there is a significant amount of, of line impedance at 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. At 50 and 60 hertz at, at regular power, there's, there's not a whole lot of line impedance, but eight feet of cable at a high frequency is gonna be an issue. So our engineer just asked if the electrician could, could ground the ground stud of the filter to the ground stud of the cabinet, and it was maybe 10 inches of, of ground wire. We were able to make that change, we took a scan, and we can see that all the noise that was right around 500 kilohertz to one megahertz went away. Again, we needed to make one ground wire shorter and it, it, it solved a bunch of problems. We didn't have to play around with different filters. And that's because we have the expertise and the experience to, to understand that there's, there's many different ways to do wiring. We understand good wiring practices and good use of filters. So we were able to identify that. The last uh, real world application I'm gonna show you guys is gonna be a radiated emission scan that we took. So instead of taking measurements on the main power line, this is a measurement out in open space. We have three meters away from the enclosure, we set up an antenna and we start taking measurements while the machine's operating. Here you can see that between 30 megahertz and maybe 45 megahertz, we were having noise that was over the limit. So again, we'd already passed conducted emissions. We had to start looking at where that noise is coming from and how that noise is propagating in open space. The engineer was able to open up the cabinet. He asked if the cabinet door was grounded which is an important step to make sure that there's, the noise can't go, come out through the door. And it, it was grounded, but again, with high frequency noise, this is even higher frequency than the last scan. We had six feet of cable connecting from the far side of the hinge of the door to all the way to the back of the enclosure was how their ground was ran. Now, again, for a safety ground, that's gonna work. You're gonna have, you're gonna have a ground there, but the line impedance at this high of a frequency is really gonna reduce the ability of that grounding wire to, to wick off that noise. So our engineer made a very simple solution to have the ground, that ground wire connect just on the inside of the hinge from the door to the inside of the panel. So very few, maybe four inches at most of ground line. We retook the scan and a lot of that frequency, a lot of that noise from the 30 to 45 megahertz frequency went away, we we're able to get a passing solution. And again, by using our exp expertise and knowledge of how high frequency noise works, we we're able to reduce this without changing filters, without making any massive changes to the design. One of the last points I wanna cover with you guys is a very common misconception that we run into when we're talking about CE testing. We often will ask somebody if they do CE testing and they say, we don't need to do it. We use all CE components. We believe that comes from 
the way that UL works, where if you use all UL components and you have it assembled in a 508A shop, then you're going to have compliance for UL. That's not the case with CE. Uh, to illustrate this point, we we pulled out a an excerpt from one of the most common drive making models that we see straight from the installation manual, and it'll tell you that the compliance of the drive itself does not insurance ensure compliance of the entire machine in all applications. And there's a very simple reason for this, and that, that goes back to when I was talking about different product standards and how the directive is, is broad and vague, and then each specific standard for the product will tell you how much noise it can make and how much it has to be immune. In this case, variable frequency drives, they have their own standard that their manufacturers have to follow for how much noise they can make. Now, the issue that you run into is industrial equipment has a different standard. So when you put that drive into an industrial equipment for generic industrial machines, the limits are going to change. And to really show you guys what we mean by that, we, we had an application in our shop where we took just a, a very common drive brand that we see, we hooked it up to a motor, we gave it power, and we took a scan of that. Now, in that scan, we set a limit line in red for the uh, variable frequency drive standard, and then we had a limit line in the blue for generic industrial equipment. So, as you can see, that green measurement, it, it's below the red for the whole scan there. But if you compare that to the industrial standard, it's over the limit for almost the whole scan. So, again, this really illustrates the point that if you have a VFD that's CE marked, it, it might not be under the limit for the product standard that you're going for. And that can only get worse if you have multiple VFDs. If you have multiple VFDs and they're all following the VFD standard, you still don't know if that noise, and it's only gonna get worse if you have multiple VFDs that are all under the VFD standard, but not underneath the correct standard. Final slide I wanna go over before I hand over to Chuck Siebold is going to be a, a detailing typical process for EMC that we see with and without Enerors help. So well, we've, we've heard a lot of horror stories of, of manufacturers that found out that they needed a machine to be CE. They had never done it before, they had little experience and they start the process. So they start researching, digging around, they find out that their local testing lab is gonna it's going to take four to five weeks to get them in there to test. So they, they schedule it four to five weeks out. They start researching. They, they get a little confused because there's a lot of standards and you don't know what applies and, and what takes precedent over what. And by the end of those four to five weeks, they, they, they may or may not have learned anything valuable to help them through the testing. They take the test and typically if they haven't had any help and they don't, they, they don't have a lot of experience, the test isn't going to pass. So at that point, they failed. The engineers at the testing lab are going to tell them that they have another four to five weeks availability for the next test. During that time, they're going to wait. They're going to maybe try to find some filters. They're going to make some guesses, probably some educated guesses, but they're never going to know. And at the end of the four to five weeks when they have their testing come, they might panic and get an, a consultant to come in. They might not. They might need some help. They don't know, and they're going to test going in again, not knowing any more than the first time, other than the fact that last time they failed and they had to make some changes. And that can continue. If they don't pass that time, they can continue going to the testing lab, finding out they're failing and trying to guess at what they need to make, make changes at. Enero's process is much different than that. We really try to help out from the beginning. So as soon as we find out that there's a manufacturer that needs help, we can recommend a good filter that goes with the VFD that they're using. And from there, if, if we find out that they, they need this machine to ship in, in a really short time frame, Enero typically is able to shuffle things around. We have multiple testing labs, multiple engineers that can, we, we can make it work most of the time to be there within two weeks. And then when we get there, it's, it's, we bring as many filters as we can. We're confident in the recommendation that we made, but obviously we're never gonna know all the details of a machine. We bring multiple other filters. We guarantee that we're gonna find them a, a passing solution before we leave. And it, on top of all this, it's gonna be at a flat rate. So it's, we're easy to predict how much it's gonna what the expense is going to be, we're able to, to budget time, and we really try to make this whole process much, much simpler and much, much easier for manufacturers. So I appreciate you guys' time. I'm going to hand it over to Chuck Seabolt now, 
She's going to go over some of the safety information. And at the end, I'll, I'll see you guys again to wrap it all up. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. Good morning. My name is Chuck Seabolt. I'm going to start by telling you a little about myself to help uh, explain the way I view CE marking. And uh, I'm also going to let you know that I assume most of you are what I would call US centric, that you know what to do to make equipment safe in the United States. I'm an engineer for a little more than 40 years, and I have a JD for a little more than 20. That means that I'm law school educated, but not taking the bar exam. For that entire 20 years, I've specialized in product safety and in European law, uh, primarily CE marking directives. This is a list that you've seen before, Dominic showed this. It's a list of the several directives that are apt to pertain to machinery. Um, I'm going to attempt in this presentation to, to use a couple of paradigms. One is to express things in, in terms of what's the same and what's different. Same, same in Europe as it is in the US. And I also want to draw attention to a difference between substance and formality. And um, the good news is that is that the substance, the safety of machinery, is everywhere the same. Europeans don't expect any greater safety than we expect in the United States, nor do they expect any less. The formality is quite different. In Europe, under the machinery directive, there's a legal obligation to write down, uh, to assess, to recognize every hazard that your equipment has and to justify your design approach as one that's safe enough. So that's generally the contents of the machinery directive. Like the EMC directive, the requirements in the machinery directive are outcome based under EMC, don't cause interference and don't be interfered with. Under the machinery directive, Annex 1 lists 60 different ways machines can hurt people. And the requirement is the machine not hurt any, any reasonable person. The low voltage directive and the machinery directive are mutually exclusive. The requirement under the low voltage directive is that when electricity is uh, applied to make something work, the presence of that electricity won't create a hazard such as electrocution, arcing, sparking, fires. That same requirement that, that electrically um, a device will not hurt people, domestic animals, or property. That exact same requirement appears as one of the 60 ways machines can hurt people. So if you have a machine, it is not covered by the low voltage directive. So what are the ramifications of this? I'll jump quickly to form. One of the formalities under every CE marking directive is that the manufacturer, and only the manufacturer is allowed to do this, and it's mandatory that the manufacturer do this, issue a document referred to as a declaration of conformity. It says, we manufacturer declare that our machine meets, must list all of the laws, all of the directives that pertain. So if you have a machine, powered moving parts, you would say we meet the machinery directive. And you would also list that we meet the EMC directive. You would not list as a matter of form the low voltage directive because formally machinery and low voltage are mutually exclusive. The pressure equipment directive likely does not pertain. I'll talk about that in more detail later. The restriction on hazardous substance directive may or may not pertain. I'll talk about that a little more later. The ATEX directive, I will spend very little time on that other than to mention that if your equipment must be classified for use in a potentially explosive environment. It requires ATEX marking. If your machine contains a potentially explosive environment but is not deployed in a classified space, then the machine is not in the ATEX directive. Finally, at the bottom of this slide, 
there's mention of something called the Eco Design Directive. It it's um, fleshed out a little bit in regulations. There is a regulation that three phase induction motors between one and 500 horsepower meet minimum efficiency. And I'll give a little more specificity on that in a minute or two. As I mentioned, the machinery directive um, requires that machinery be safe. I'd mentioned the formal difference that the manufacturer reduced to writing, how he reasoned that the machine is safe enough. Um, there's a requirement to introduce a, a document referred to as a declaration of conformity. Underneath the directive, so substitute in your mind perhaps, directive is statutory law, something like Congress might pass or your state legislator. It's the same idea. Directive is a law, and so it's mandatory. Like the EMC directive, underneath the machinery directive and the low voltage directive and the ATEX directive are a number of standards, type A standard, type B standard, and type C. A type A standard is a standard that has universal applicability. Risk assessment is a type A standard. You can risk assess anything. A type B standard is one that has systemic properties, meaning that it might address a pneumatic type of circuit or a hydraulic type of circuit or an electric circuit. And so many machine designers are interested in the European standard. I'm going to use its number, 60204-1. It is a very close parallel to NFPA 79, which is the standard used in the United States it's the standard used by UL 508 panel shops. So the US standard and the European standard for electrical safety are very much alike. A type C standard is one that's for a specific type of machine. There's a type C standard for vacuum cleaners. So if your machine is a vacuum cleaner, you would obtain the type C standard for vacuum cleaners. And it would in turn say, use EN 60204-1 for electrical safety would point back to other systemic sorts of standards. Another systemic one is guarding safety distances, if you will. Now here's a difference, and it's a little bit interesting. At the top of the European pyramid, we have statutory law directive. There is a thing at the top of the pyramid in the US. It's your plaintiff's lawyer. It's litigation. is what drives machine builders in the United States to make their equipment according to what is referred to in the law as state of the art. In Europe, state of the art is expressed in standards. So as you deal with European customers, they'll be pretty keen on meeting the standards. And you will likely be keen on meeting them too, but perhaps for a slightly different reason. Addressing hazards, <clears throat> this is common um, worldwide. There's, this is a legal principle that happens to be expressed in the machinery directive. It's called the design hierarchy. When you as a machine designer create a machine that has a hazard, your first option should be to design it out. By way of example, I'll use a hydraulic or pneumatic cylinder with a clevis on the rod. If when fully retracted, that creates a pinch point, perhaps you could design a rod that, that, or design the machine so that the clevis stops short of the front face of the cylinder, thereby not creating a crushing zone. Always the first choice, design the hazard out. Second choice is to erect a barrier, which is either place it out of reach with distance or a guard is what's commonly, commonly referred to here. Design out, guard, a last resort, if neither one of those is possible, is to warn the user against a hazard. Now here again, I'm gonna describe what's the same and what's different going from the US and Europe. What's the same is when you have a hazard, you must describe to the reader, the nature of the hazard, how bad they'll be hurt, and what do they do to avoid the injury. Those same pieces of information have to appear in Europe, but in Europe, instead of on the equipment, it's in the manual. And by the way, this, this introduces another difference. When you sell machinery into Europe, there's a requirement, and this is expressed in the machinery directive, that the manual be translated into the language or languages of the destination country. Think about that ahead of time, because there's a cost associated with that, Perhaps you want to pass it to your customer or have your customer agree to perform the translation in Europe. Risk assessment is an activity that some of us undertake intuitively. Most of us do with <clears throat> normal around the house or out on the playground routines. But risk assessment requires 
uh, a person who's creating a risk or undertaking an activity to, to take account of the magnitude of injury that's involved and how frequently might this um, cause of injury be confronted? How, you know, how frequently is a person exposed to this? And the last item is whether or not the person who is exposed is able to avoid injury. So these three factors are the minimum factors that play into risk assessment. The machine redirective doesn't dictate any particular form for risk assessment. There's a standard 12100-1 uh, describes a certain method of doing risk assessment that lays out a table. Most of you have seen those, uh, but the form isn't mandatory. What is mandatory is the substance. And I can't impress that too much. It's very important that your machine be safe for its intended use and reasonably foreseeable misuse. This slide illustrates under the machinery directive, its standard 60204-1 for electrical safety, certain non-compliances. Some of these are common in the United States and in Europe. It's one ground conductor per terminal. So you can see um, that's not always done. In this case, in the bottom figure, there's five, five conductors landing on one stud. It's non-compliant to the standard. It doesn't necessarily mean it's against the law or dangerous but it certainly doesn't meet the standard and your customers might notice that and ask you to make a correction. The upper, the upper photo shows a difference. In the United States under NFPA 79, protective earthing conductors can be solid green or green with a yellow stripe or 50-50 green and yellow. In Europe, ground conductors, if the only identification is by color, if identification of a ground conductor is by color alone, then the ground conductor has to be green and yellow, 50-50, 30% green, 30% yellow, but nominally 50-50. So this is a fairly common non-compliance that uh, we find in the field. This is another one that comes to us out of EM60204-1. Under that standard and not under the US NFBA 79 standard, the handle for a disconnect will be gray or black. Here we see a red disconnect handle over a yellow background and in this case, it's in near proximity to an e-stop button with the same color configuration. This creates a risk of confusion. When we're asked, what do we do about the disconnect handle? If the disconnect handle is not in the same view as an e-stop, we would typically say, this is a non-compliance, but it doesn't result in a risk of confusion and it doesn't create an unreasonably dangerous machine. But if they're in the same view, then someone may be in a panic, will hit the disconnect and not the e-stop, machine doesn't stop, and their argument in court against you will be if you had followed the standard, this injury wouldn't have been as bad and maybe not happen at all. Legend plates for Europe, uh, they prefer because it's a multilingual uh, regime, 26 languages, one machine fits everybody. Um, under the law or under the standards, the preference is to use symbols. You can use language, so many customers prefer English language, but just bear in mind that translation can reach beyond translating the manual. And finally, the, um, the danger sign on this is an old ANSI standard. It's uh, not even correct to use in the United States. The European standard for symbols for electrical hazard is the same as in the US. It's the uh, yellow, triangle uh, background with a red lightning bolt. This is a reasonable misuse situation and reflects what I consider to be illegal, literally illegal. The standard for interlock controls directs that the interlock switch will be not easy to defeat. This interlock switch is easy to defeat. So when the door is open, if the person wants to run watching the, the beater, shaft rotate, maybe it makes his life easier, you know, it's less work, I get more production, lower scrap. The second and third shift people are going to run this machine with the door open and God forbid one of them loses their arm because you could have designed this using a switch that can't be defeated. Um, now, most machine builders will say, yeah, but that's a misuse. The law requires, the law requires this, and this is stated expressly in the machinery directive, although it is a reflection of case law. 
Machines must be designed for reasonably foreseeable misuse, whatever that is. And you know better than we do what reasonably foreseeable misuse is. You know what shortcuts your customers take. The low voltage directive, as I had mentioned, is mutually exclusive with the machinery directive. I'll not elaborate more on that. This illustrates, again, an illegal condition. Um, follows the low voltage directive slide because this is literally just an electrical hazard and it is an electrical hazard. It's a requirement or one of the ways to render hazardous voltage safe is to take to ground a reliable low impedance path, all exposed conductive parts that could become energized live with hazardous voltage. And I know that's a mouthful, but that's what the standard says. This illustrates an electrical motor that unbeknownst to us until we tested for ground continuity, everything looks fine. We've got a cable running to the motor, um, the motor's connected, I can look inside the, the, the motor electrical attachment points, all the wires are there. But at the other end, at the, it just happened to be a plug, somebody had cut the ground conductor and just didn't bother to connect it. This is dangerous. And if there's ever an insulation failure on that electric motor and high voltage is impressed on the outside, and a person comes in contact and is electrocuted, you lose. Obviously, the electrocuted person did too. But you, you made an unsafe machine and you'll be liable for that. Liability meaning that the injured person gets to take your money to cover his, his injury. The ROHS directive has been around for a little more than a decade. It started to apply to most industrial machinery about a year ago, 19th, 22nd of July, 2019. Two exceptions are large scale fixed um, installations. I guess two or three, they, they all boil down to large scale fixed for what it's worth. And to put a little bit of, uh, a little of idea what that represents, a steel mill is large scale fixed. Printing presses for newspapers are large scale fixed. A 40,000 pound five axis machining center is not fixed industrial application. Sometimes small machines, and they're, especially if they're special purpose, will only go into, and I'll use a specific example, pharmaceutical packaging factory, it isn't gonna move. Once the pharma plant's located, even if it's small packaging machinery dedicated to that product, in other words, it can't be easily converted to another, could arguably come under this part of a large scale fixed installation, even though the equipment itself is not large scale. How do you demonstrate compliance with ROHS? You must, you the builder, must account for every part of that machine down to plating and painting and ink must meet the, uh, anything that can be mechanically separated, must not have greater content of lead, cadmium, hexavalent chrome, it's dichromate, certain flame retardant materials, certain materials that add flexibility to vinyls. Uh, the way you demonstrate compliance is to annotate or have a bill of material that includes a column or two for ROHS, one is a compliant, two, how did you reach that conclusion? You don't have to get certs for everything. If your machine's made from carbon steel, the standard chemistry for carbon steel illustrates compliance with the ROHS directive. The Eco Design Directive applies, as I mentioned, to three phase induction motors from one to 500 horsepower. If they're connected directly to mains, they must be IE3 efficient. If they're running from, an, from a VFD, they must be IE2. A question that comes up from time to time is, so what if I sell a machine that has a motor that's not compliant? Well, should that be detected by somebody who has the authority to enforce the law, you'll likely be asked to replace the motor. Nobody's going to jail, but it is at minimum embarrassing and it's gonna cost you the price of a motor to remedy it. And the authorities have the legal right to shut the equipment down. They rarely do, but they have the right. This illustrates another I'll use the word pitfall, it's not really a pitfall. This is another area where your machine may not meet a European directive that it needs to meet, it's pressure equipment. Most machinery is out of the scope of the pressure equipment directive because none of the pressure bearing components on the machine are any greater than category one under the pressure equipment directive. Wow. So how do you know if it's above category one we have to understand the pressure equipment directive. This is something that we do for you, but just as a quick heads up, 
the graph on the right hand side is four pressure bearing vessels that are bearing a gaseous fluid that is not hazardous. So under the pressure equipment directive, fluids can either be liquid or gaseous with the phase being determined at atmospheric pressure and the temperature of the fluid inside the container. Um, whether or not the fluid under pressure is hazardous or poison or explosive or flammable or not, the size of the vessel or the diameter of the pipe and the pressure. So on the vertical axis, we have pressure. On the horizontal axis, we have volume in liters. And there's a diagonal line that represents 200 bar times liter. If you go above that line, 200 bar time liter, you're greater than category one. You cross into the threshold or you're category two or higher. A five gallon air tank, hypothetically, rated at 150 PSI. So it's 10 bar, five gallons is roughly 20 liters. 20 liters times 10 bar is 200 bar times liter. And now here we are above category one or certainly close to it. So this is an item where it's not unusual for an American builder to have an ASME tank, uh, you know, compressed air tank for some reason, think everything's hunky dory. Again, if, if an inspector in Europe notices that this tank is missing the CE marking, the tank is illegal in Europe and will have to be replaced with, with one that's legal. Another common component that exceeds category one is hydraulic accumulators. And, and greater than one liter, the, the trick there is that you'll notice on the right-hand side, there's a little bump up. And, and that vertical line uh, to the right of the vertical axis is one liter. So one liter volume with 200 bar capacity, right? That's 3,000 PSI. 3,000 PSI hydraulic accumulator is garden variety common. So one liter, bigger than one liter accumulator pretty easily gets above category one. This is my last slide. Uh, another thing that we do, and this plays into risk assessment, and this standard ISO 13849-1, in the US there's a standard similar to this. It's been around for a while, ANSI B11.19. <clears throat> These standards aim to um, cause, encourage, uh, they can't necessarily force a designer. But they aim to encourage you to introduce reliability in your, in your control loops, generally commensurate with the downside risk. Everybody's familiar with aircraft. And aircraft these days are built with redundant uh, control systems to manipulate the control loops. Some of you older folks may remember automobiles back in the day had single master brake cylinder. If it fails, your brakes are gone. That's a big deal. And so because the downside risk, the ramifications of a failure of brakes for falling out of the sky or potentially death, maybe multiple deaths, uh, the law decided, hey, look, it makes sense. We're going to hold these people liable if they don't introduce redundancy or somehow make their control system reliable enough. And by the way, reliable enough in the United States is decided by a jury, informed by the plaintiff's expert. <clears throat> and so that's roughly your standard, right? One of the things we bring is um, we understand 13849-1, which is in itself a fairly complicated standard, but it carves the reliability of control loops into five categories called performance levels, A being the lowest, A, B, C, D, and E being the most reliable. The reliability of a control loop can be estimated using this standard 13849-1. Some of you may have confronted European customers who said, hey, I want the interlocks to be PLD, you know, capital P, capital L, lowercase d, whatever that means. That comes right out of 13849-1. When we, when we assess machinery for safety, one of the things that we do is we apply 13849-1 in what I would call a sensible way. Um, and, and we'll provide what our opinion of what the estimated reliability is for that control loop. Before I hand it back to Dominic, there's a point that many people that undertake CE marking in the US fail to recognize. And that's that when you sell in both regimes, when you create variety in your product, your complete product variety, everything you make is potentially used against you by the plaintiff's lawyers. So we're mindful of that 
and and we will not we'll we'll strive to not write down something that you must do if it's not something that you've done or do uh, routinely in the future we'll occasionally run into a machine builder where his customer in europe insists on a fence but he says we only do it for the europeans our report will be will be written in such a way that the fence is not a requirement because anything that's written down for on your behalf or by you is used against you anything you say or do can and will be used against you in a court of law. So this is one of the things that we bring that is not part of a typical CE marking assessment. We understand the way that your universe of production works in the real world, um, and we aim to document things in a way that's uh, satisfactory for the, for the public. And I think everybody has exactly the same interest here, and that's that no reasonable person ever be injured by your equipment. With that, I hope to see some of you in person uh, at some point in the future, and uh, I'll hand it right back over to Dominic. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you. So thank you, Chuck. I appreciate that. Now we have a few minutes left here. Uh, I would like to go over a brief rundown of Enter's history just to give you guys some perspective on where we're coming from. We started out in the early 1990s. Uh, we were founded by a physicist who worked a lot with early IGBTs and VFDs. And he saw that there was a lot of, a lot of noise being made by these devices and he wanted to find a solution for them. So he, he founded Thin Motor, which was a company that was working on making solutions to these problems. He did successful on that. And over the years, he was able to open up a a sales location in the United States, and that was Enerdor. So when Enerdor came around in 2007, we were able to start doing CE testing in the United States. Over time, he's been able to open additional sales locations in Germany and in Switzerland, and we also have acquired a secondary manufacturing facility in Hungary. And then in 2017, we were able to combine all of these under the same label as Enerdor engineered by Finmar. So important point here is that we were founded 30 years ago by a physicist who understood really deep down the, the noise that's being made by IGBTs and VFDs. So to touch on some of the key points of this presentation that NRO can bring to you guys and that NRO wants you to know is that 80% of the time that a manufacturer tries to bring a machine through CE testing, he's not going to pass conducted emissions unless he has some sort of help. It's, it's a huge number of people that are disappointed. Enero's process really is designed to help the vast majority of people who aren't able to meet compliance the first time they try, where we have a guaranteed solution we can help them through. Additionally, what we're finding increasingly, day to day, is that large multinational corporations are starting to require across the board that all of the machines that they use be CE marked. And that's that's just filtering down through and everybody's getting more and more closer and closer to meeting international compliance schemes. It's very important to realize that this is coming and it's it can only help your machines to make sure that they're making less noise and they're more immune. Finally, we have a lot of people that we work with and they've been burned by the CE compliance process. They've had a lot of frustration, a lot of heartache on it, and they just they don't think it's possible for their company or their machines to go through the CE compliance process. And we, we love to dispel that myth and show that it can be easy, it can be simple, and that we are willing to help. So all in all, there really is no machine that's impossible to get through CE testing. Finally, our mission statement is to provide superior products with a technical ability to understand the root cause of power quality problems. And this really is just a function of the idea that Enerdor is doing CE testing as well as manufacturing EMI and RFI filters. And the idea there is that when we design a filter, we're able to use our, our in-field experience in order to leverage that into the design. And then once we have that filter made, we're able to take it out into the field, try it on different machines, see where it works, see where it doesn't work, and get a better understanding and to build up and increase our portfolio of filters that we have to bring to customers and provide solutions. 
So this is, the, this is the last slide we have. We don't have a whole lot of time for questions. I apologize for that. Uh, I did want to go over just to make sure you guys were aware of the other things that Endor offers. So we have EMI and RFI filters. We also have motor protection products. So TV over DT filters, sine wave filters. We have active and passive harmonic filters, and we, we do have both stabilizers. So again, anything within that realm of power quality, noise issues, we can help out with. We really do specialize though in EMI and RFI filters and solving and helping people meet CE compliance issues. So at this time, it doesn't appear there's any lingering questions that were left. So I'm gonna finally thank you guys for last time for coming onto this webinar. I really appreciate your you being here. We're excited to present this information and we hope to be hearing from you soon. Thank you very much.